Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. It is the Sulaiman Ravid Show. It is Friday evening once again. I trust that you had a wonderful Jumu'ah. I was out at uh, Masjid Qurtuba and uh, that's in Linbro Park for the first time. Beautiful masjid, beautiful setting, wonderful kind of uh, environment. Really enjoyed it and uh, it's always a pleasure when uh, you are in a masjid on a hot day like it was today here in the Gauteng region and, and they have the ability to just open many windows, big, big windows and, and the top parts also all open up and you just get that breeze. You don't need that, that aircon, you know. Uh, the aircon gives you a kind of relief but it's an artificial relief but the natural breeze subhanallah during the time of juma it was absolutely fantastic and then what happened thereafter was even more fantastic alhamdulillah i had the opportunity today to witness the diversion of islam by one of our sisters and then uh, the nikah thereafter to uh, to a brother who had also recently uh, reverted to islam and may Allah wa ta'ala bless them both. May Allah wa ta'ala uh, grant all the goodness to that uh, particular union and take them from strength to strength and uh, grant them a long life in each other's uh, company and in pious offspring. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Many times those of us who are born Muslims, we are born Muslims, um, we only then realize the value of, of, of Islam when we hear or we listen to the story of the reverts. There are many things in our deen uh, that we take for granted, you know. Uh, we, we, we know it theoretically, but we, we don't realize how important it is in terms of creating a sense of purpose, in terms of creating balance in life, in terms of giving you a sense of uh, knowing what your objective is, why you have been created, where you're heading, what you're doing, what you're all about, uh, what's the meaning of, of your existence. We, we tend to take all of those things for granted and Islam provides it for us and, and we don't appreciate it and we don't build on it and we don't internalize it uh, to the extent that um, that we need to but then when when you when you see uh, the impact that uh, islam has on those who, who revert and, and come to islam and and uh, when you hear them express their emotions in terms of what impressed them about islam what drew them to islam and what islam means to them and, and the difference it made to their lives notwithstanding the challenges that they sometimes or many times have to face in the lead up to it and even uh, post it uh, that makes us uh, appreciate our deen more and many, many a time I have seen this, that uh, those who revert to Islam, uh, they, they, they actually put those who were born to Islam to shame in terms of compliance to the deen and dedication to the teachings of Islam and, and wearing Islam as a badge of honor, not, you know, not being an apologetic Muslim uh, in any way whatsoever. So today, in the first segment uh, of the program, we are going to be speaking to a brother who has recently reverted to Islam. That is uh, brother, Yahna, brother Yahya uh, Vakhanar, and uh, we're going to talk to him about his story, we're going to talk to him about uh, what drew him to Islam. But there also, there's, there's this one aspect, you know, uh, many people are involved uh, in terms of bringing people closer to Islam and then bringing them into the fold of Islam. But they sometimes face huge challenges uh, post the reversion. And, and we also need to, to, to understand what those challenges are and to perhaps think about how we, we can support uh, those who revert to Islam in terms of uh, overcoming those challenges after they have uh, accepted uh, the deen. Well, Brother Yahya, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh and uh, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you and um, tell you about uh, my journey. Well, firstly, before we talk about the reversion and, and, and what has happened subsequent to that, just introduce yourself to our viewers. Tell us more about yourself, uh, your life story in brief. Okay, well, basically, um, um, I went to school and after school I decided that I had a real passion in life and my passion is wildlife. Um, after studying, I had a bit of a, of a difficulty finding a job and I uh, had the opportunity to actually work with wildlife hands-on. So I started working hands-on with lions and tigers and cheetahs and wild dogs as a, a form of training them, but enrichment training, not circus-based training. And um, that's uh, basically it. Uh, uh, later on became Tiger Man, um, being the first man in the world to train down Siberian tigers, which are the world's wow. biggest cats. So I went on with my life and I eventually met a lady and um, we had a child together. 
but my life was not good. I had lots of fun around in my life and I was searching and searching and searching for God, um, but always in the wrong places. Mm, mm. And um, eventually it cost me my marriage, it cost me her leaving with my daughter and uh, me hitting rock bottom. And it was at that stage that I met two very influential people in my life who had purchased a tiger from me and actually kept me on to look after the tiger and to make sure the tiger has the best possible life that it could have. Mm. Let me just stop you there. I, obviously, that's the core part of what we were to discuss uh, this evening. But before we get to that, I'm sure you know you, you mentioned it in such a matter of fact way because it's, it's become such a routine in your life. But to, to, to deal with these animals, was there ever a fear factor? And if there was, how, how did you overcome it? And uh, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with, the, with that aspect of that? You know, they, they are predators then by nature. Yeah, I've, uh, it's, it's actually a worrying concern. Um, and you do fear them. But there is a difference between fear and respect. Mm. I respect the animals, they respect me. I've got my boundaries, they've got their boundaries. I don't overstep my boundaries with them. And um, I, I don't like them to overstep their boundaries with me. So there are rules. Don't go in the enclosure when it's raining. Don't go in the enclosure at night. Um, don't go near them when they're mating. Don't go near them when they're eating. Um, and once you keep up with those rules, then you kind of um, know that you can survive in interaction with them. Having said that, I believe that Allah to Allah has given everyone a gift. Some people are accountants, other people are mathematicians, other people are business people. And my gift is that I understand the predator. I can be with them, I can almost sense what they are feeling. Um, and there are days that I feel, you know what, I don't want to go into this enclosure today. I don't feel safe. Let me stay away. There are other days when they're the most loving animals in the world. When you talk about enrichment training, what does enrichment training mean? Well, basically, you know, in a perfect world, right, animals would be in the wild, okay? But as we know that the world's not so perfect anymore, you've got poaching going on, and, and the sad part of it, in the last 50 years, we've lost three species of tigers. And uh, it's due to poaching and hunting and... Um, taking away their natural environment for houses. Um, so as a result, the animals in the wild are not doing well. Mm. And um, in order for them to, for, in, in order for us to continue conservation with them, we have to keep them in enclosures. But the immediate danger of keeping an animal in an enclosure is that now they don't have to hunt for their food, they don't have to maintain a territory, they don't have to go looking for a, for a, for a bait. So you provide all of that for them. So they tend to become lazy, they become fat, and eventually die of heart attacks. So the program that I've, I've invented and the program that I've designed is not taking an animal, putting it on, in a circus, and making him do tricks. Mm. It's not that at all. It's making the animal do the exercise that he would have been doing in the wild. If you don't do that, animals become lazy, they become fat, and they will die of heart attacks. So it's really for the benefit of the animals who are living in enclosures. Interesting. And, and, and lastly, on this point, you were mentioning that you were the first in the world to do, to do what? To train down a Siberian tiger. Okay, and where was that? That was a place called Rhino and Lion Nature Reserve um, in Krugerstorp. And um, a lot of people were afraid of Siberian tigers because of their size. I mean, a fully grown male weighs over 350 kilograms. Whoa. M females, you're looking at about... 250. But um, if, if people had to Google me and go see that I used to make two tigers stand with their paws on my shoulders, like standing next to me like giants. Sure. And um, they are just very much misunderstood. Um, I'm not saying that everyone should go out, buy a tiger and keep him, keep him as a pet. Hmm. If you're going to do something like that, do your research because they do get huge. It costs a lot of money to look after them. And I don't really encourage it. Um, they, they belong where they belong. But if you do decide to keep one, make sure that you are able to give it the best life possible. Have you had, ever had any incident? Yes, I've been mauled five times. Whoa. But by lions. So are lions more aggressive than tigers? Um, lions have got a shorter fuse. fuse. Okay. So you can get away with more with, with uh, tigers than lions. And uh, tigers are very intelligent. But then, then on the other hand, 
tigers are solitary animals. They're not used to other species being around them, other things being around them. Whereas lions are one of the few um, gregarious animals that live in prides or live in a group. And um, with these animals, you should be, um, the, the, they've got that natural instinct to allow everything to be around them, a whole pride to be around them. So when you're working with lions, it's very important that you become part of the tribe, uh, part of the pride. And whereas tigers, you're going to come in and go out, you can't really stay with them for long periods, um, but they're tamed down just as well. All right, so coming back to your life story, right? Uh, you, you mentioned you were involved in a lot of vice, a lot of wrong. Uh, you, your marriage didn't work, your, your partner left, left with the child. Uh, then you met two wonderful individuals. Take, take, take up the story from there. So basically, um, I met uh, two families, um, and they're now brothers. Um, and back then, I was searching, I was searching, I was searching. But I still had so much bad in my life. And um, after having a discussion with the one family uh, who advised me, listen, you know, we've taken it this far. We've noticed, you know, that sometimes you don't look so good mm -hmm. and you need to really look at your life. And, and that's when I started um, cancelling some of the stuff around my life. And I was, looking for, I was looking for God. I grew up in a Christian home. I started going back to church and I just didn't feel f fulfillment in life going to, those, going to the church. And um, it took about two years for me to actually revert. Um, I started speaking to them, they, they started telling me about what it means to be, be a Muslim and um, what I Islam is and what it's all about and that Islam actually means peace. Back then, I was under the same impression as everyone else. I thought a Muslim was someone who takes a bomb, straps it to his, to his, to his body and walks into a mall and blows everyone up. Because unfortunately that's what the media portrays it as. Hmm. And um, when I met these people, I was like, my friends would say, would say like, Muslims are this and Muslims are this. And I would like argue with them because it's not what I saw. You know, I spent time with these guys and they were um, the one brother I spent lots of time with inside the enclosure with, with the tiger, his name's Kira. And um, I saw that they had such inner peace. And my life was just in turmoil. So I started reading the Quran and I started uh, reading books about um, Allah to Allah and about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And um, my greatest hurdle was to tell my family. And that was what was going to stop me. And then I'm, I've actually known this brother for quite a while, but he had also just reverted his name is Musa now. And I called him in one, or I asked him if he could actually talk. And he told me, he just went and told his family and they accepted it. And he took the shiad. That, that, I think a day later, <coughs> I was going to the office and I had a meeting with them, with the Milana and I took shiad too. So my family didn't take it so well. Initially they did, but unfortunately I have lost family members. My girlfriend at the time has broken up with me since I reverted. Um, I was actually kicked out of the house. I was homeless for a night. But, um, you know, the support structure with the <coughs> brothers has really helped me a lot. And they helped me find a flat and I'm on my feet again and I'm growing. Well, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we continue the discussion with Brother Yahya and we talk about his reversion to Islam. <laughs> Welcome back. With us in studio this evening, we have brother Yahya Vakhanar and he's a revert to Islam and we're talking about his journey. We're talking about his story. So the one question I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier on that uh, it was it was in a piece that you, that you saw in, in your friends who were Muslims. Uh, besides that, what was it about Islam and Muslims that, that attracted you to the deen? Basically, when I started really spending time with the, with the guys, I started feeling, actually getting a feeling that Islam is not a religion. It's a way of life. And um, there's so much good qualities in their life. I mean, before you pray five times a day, you have to go and make wudu and make yourself clean. Mm. And um, the way you, you actually pray and you go down and you go up and it's all got um, health benefits to it and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And not only that, you actually see how Allah to Allah is blessing 
the, the pious people who actually go to the mosque and, and actually pray and spend time with Allah Ta'ala and read the Quran and recite the Quran and um, study everything. So, started so seeing that and the way they treat their, 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 their wives and the way they treat their family and their family structure, um, it was just amazing. And then you look at you look at your family structure and how everything's just falling apart all the time, um, and the close connection that Muslim families have to each other. And you look at go back to my my family situation where some of my uncles I haven't seen in four years. Um, so it was that, and then the way they they spoke to each other and they greeted each other with a hug, and that they are brothers, mm. not just uh, you know what he's, he he worships the same. Same God as I do. They are brothers. We are we are all brothers. And when I actually started going to the masjid and spending time at the masjid, where people used to come and hug me, brothers came and hugged me and said, "Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for 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 joining for joining our religion and and um, making the best choice you could have made." And that type of brotherhood and friendship you don't get in in a church. You know, there you sit there and you can't talk to each other, you're afraid to be there and whatever the case may be. But in Islam it's totally different. What was the feeling like at the time of your reversion? I felt clean. The day I took Shahada, the next day I phoned um, a very good friend of mine and I told him, you know, it's since I've reverted, I feel like I've got no worries. Right? All my worries that I had, I can just ask Allah to, Allah to help me with them. And I felt like I'd been washed. I'd been washed with bleach. Everything mm. was gone. All my bad, all my, evil, all my evil ways was all gone. And things that I thought was quite big in my life, which I thought that I'd never be able to give up, the next day was just gone. Never touched it again. Coming back to the point about your family and the fears that you had, take us through that, that process when you approach them what was the reaction initially and then what was the reaction later on and, and did that shake you psychologically and emotionally? Well, I grew up in a very close family. So, um, and we, we are very Christian based. I mean, my grandmother's a missionary. Um, and there is value to that that I'll talk to you about later on. But um, when I first told them, they were like, okay, well, I think for them it was more like, a, you know, this is something he's going through. Give him a couple of months, this will go away. A phase? Yeah, it's a phase he's going through. He's just, you know, he's trying to change his life. He's trying to fix things up in his life. No, I'll give him a couple of months. He'll go back to the way he was. But when they started seeing that I was serious about this and that I'm going to Masala, I'm busy learning, I want to become a Milana, um, they started getting worried about it. And um, my immediate family wasn't, was quite, quite good with it because my brother is married to a Muslim. Um, but further along the line, they started turning their backs on me. And even my girlfriend at the time, when I told her, she was like, okay, yeah, it's fine, it's your choice, it's your religion. And it, it went well, I mean, I thought it was going well. And then one day, it was a Saturday, I remember it was a Saturday, and um, we were sitting in the lounge, and we had some friends over. And first she got irritated with me because I turned down white. They were all drinking wine, they were having a, a bright side. So I turned down the wine and then I went and made another fire for my meat, which irritated her even more. Mm. And then I told her at, um, when it came to Makhrib prayer that I'm going to go to the masjid and pray there, which irritated her even more. And um, I could see that things were not right. And then I went and did my, my, I read my salah inside the bedroom. And she ran in there, flung open the door, started screaming and shouting, get out of my house, you bring evil into my house, whatever the case would be. And there I was, out. And I had really nowhere to go. Um, I, luckily that night I had a couple of rain on me and I managed to get into a hotel. And then the next morning I started looking for a flat. And that's where I am now. I think it's important that, that people realize the challenges that Revert sometimes face. Um, after you know, uh, going back on, on a religion that perhaps they were born into and, and, and following and that their family members still follow and embracing Islam. 
do, do you do you have friends who have also reverted? Have others also had similar struggles? Do you? Yes, we've got a whole group. We've started on Facebook a, a, a brothers group on Facebook, where we support each other. Um, we talk to each other about our problems. We come up with solutions. And the nice thing about our support group is that we've got seven or eight Milanas on that group mm. who can help us as well. Plus some um, Muslims that have grown up as a Muslim. Um, so we've always got the support structure. So I'm quite lucky and, and my brothers are quite lucky. But I also realise out there there are other brothers who haven't got that support structure. And that is what we would like to actually help them with. Um, because there are challenges. There are challenges. I mean, all of a sudden you've got to shave where you never used to shave before. You can't eat certain food, you can eat other food. Um, certain things that you grew up that in your life was fine is now haram. Um, pork you can't touch, yet we grew up eating pork. Obviously you need to go get circumcised. Um, all that kind of stuff is, is what's waiting for us. And it is challenging. Um, you've got to sit when you go to the toilet. But once you start realising the benefits of it, mm. I mean, they've actually done some scientific research that by sitting when you um, go urinate, actually helps you with prostate cancer. So people who sit and when they urinate don't get prostate, prostate cancer. So there's so much benefits to the way our life is led now. And it's amazing that our prophet, uh, peace be upon him, did it 1,400 years ago, you know, without the scientific stuff that we've got now. He came up with all these, um, these suggestions of how we should live our life. The masjid, what does the masjid mean to you? It actually means a lot to me. Um, at first, when, when I first reverted, I thought Muslims were like, you know what, these guys, yeah, they don't eat pork, they've got their food that they buy from their restaurants, um, from their butcheries, which is obviously a love food. And then they go to mosque on a, on a Friday and then they go pray. And the rest of the week they, you know, they read the Quran and they just spend time with the brothers. And then I started going to the mosque only for the prayer, right? And um, I started getting a lot of um, prayer in my life. And then I thought, okay, well, let me try doing another prayer as well. And I started going for um, the Isha and Maghrib. I'm sorry, the Asr and Maghrib. And then my life started to change there already. So I started including the um, Isha and Fajr prayer. And then it just went amazing. You know, I learned so quickly, I learned so easily. Things were starting to go right in my life. Um, business that was slow at one stage has now increased quite a bit. So. I soon realised that the masjid for me is like a tree, right? And as long as you're going to the masjid, you are like a leaf on that tree. And when you attach yourself to a masjid, you start to flourish like, like a leaf is. And you start to become green and you look healthy and you look beautiful. And then something happens and you stop going to the mosque. And then spiritually you start to die, you know? And then later on you start becoming brown, you get pushed around by um, the wind, the, 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 the water sweeps you out, which reflects the world and a shaitan, and um, eventually, spiritually, you die. Okay, and I realised that as long as I was going to the mosque, as long as I was making my five prayers, um, I was flourishing, I was spiritually, financially, all with all um, aspects of, of, of the din. Um, and then I came to realize that, you know what, I'm not happy being just a leaf anymore. I would like to mean something more to the tree mm. and actually be, be, get to the point where I can become the root, which is a Malana. Um, but Allah to Allah made me walk a different type of journey. Um, some people are born as Muslims. Other people he uses to go into the world, experience different stuff, learn the Bible mm. for something that you can, you can use later on. So when I become a, a, a Milana, I would like to take it to the white community, 
take Islam to the white community. I always make a joke, but it's quite true. I don't know if there is a masjid in Fentes Dorp, but if there is, if there's not one, I would like to start it one day. Inshallah. 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 What advice would you give to those who are inclining towards Islam, who are thinking of reverting? Firstly, is don't believe the stuff that you hear. Don't believe the stuff that you see on TV. Don't believe the stuff that you hear in the media. It is not true, right? Um, find someone who's strong in his deen, spend time with them, start reading the Quran. The more time you spend with Allah to Allah, the more time you spend with Muslims, you start realizing very quickly that it is the right way. It is a true religion. It's the oldest religion that there is. It's one of the, I think it's the second fastest growing religion out there at the moment. And um, I always thought that, you know, if I had to become a Muslim, the, the Muslims aren't going to accept me because of my, the color of my skin. And yet, it's been the opposite. My brother, my, my own people have kind of just pushed me aside. And it's the Muslims that have said, brother, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Come, let us teach you. Let us show you the right way to live your life. What advice would you give to, to Muslims who were born Muslims in terms of da'wah, in terms of how they should interact and how they should treat reverts to Islam? Um, I think that um, with, with, my, with my masjid, which is Lake, Lake, Lakefield Masjid in Benoni, they've done it the right way because I didn't feel like I was an outsider. From the first day I walked in there, um, I felt like part of the family. And even... Um, um, the one Milana, I call him Mufti. Um, he's got a very special part of my life. There are two Milanas that are teaching us in the classes. Um, you can go with them to, with any problem. They sit down with you any time of the day. They sit down with you and they guide you, they teach you, they give you advice. Um, so as far as other Muslims are concerned, that we are just people. And we also want to live in Jannah. We don't want to go to hell. Yeah. A lot of us don't know about Islam and there's a lot of people that actually want to know. And we would like to actually eventually have a support structure for revertees or people who are, who are thinking of reverting. Because as you know, um, in the Islam belief, we believe that we were all born Muslims. Mm. So that's why we, we revert and not convert. Mm. And... Um, they can contact us, maybe get hold of us. We can help them with whatever challenges they're facing. Give them a Quran that they can read. Um, and just help them take shahada and change their lives. And just before I let you go, you, you mentioned you want to become a scholar, an alim, a mulana. What else are your hopes and aspirations in terms of the future? Well, basically that. And I would like to eventually... One thing I can, I can tell you for sure is that I love animals. Um, I love watching Allah to Allah's creation, right? And I feel that there are some people out there who are born to be mathematicians, lawyers, or whatever the case may be. But there's a select group of people that Allah to Allah chose to look after his creation. And I would like to reflect Allah's creation to people, start showing them the animals, showing them the systems of nature, how it all works, how it all comes together. And then once you start realizing that's the system, you can see that it's not from evolution. There's a stronger power out there that put the, everything together, that keeps everything functioning, that st stops comets hitting the earth. And that evolution is just something that someone thought of. And as a scientist, and I grew up as a scientist, I also believed in, in evolution. But the more you think about it, the more time you start sp spending time in the Quran, the more time you start looking at, at the creation and how it works, you start realizing, no, it can't be. It can't be like that. And uh, that was the beauty of it. So I would like to eventually start showing Allah through nature. It's been fascinating listening to your life story, Brother Yahya. Jazakumullah for your time this evening and all the best. Now, thank you very much for having me. Having me. 
to your viewers, I just want to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was uh, Brother Yahya Vakhnar and he's a river to Islam. What a touching story. It reminds us to appreciate this greatest bounty which Allah has given us. And that is uh, the bounty of Iman, the bounty of faith. And we have a responsibility towards others taking the message to them. And when they come and they revert and come back to Islam and enter the fold of Islam, we have a responsibility to, to assist them and to help them and uh, to uh, offer our support to them. Time for a break. When we come back, we continue. Okay, welcome back. What a touching story, wasn't it, uh, Brother Yahya Fakhanar? And uh, those of us who are born into Islam, really, it, uh, it, it, it should be a wake-up call for us in terms of how we should appreciate our deen and um, how we should value this iman and this faith which Allah wa ta'ala has granted us. And that um, there are people out there who are willing to listen. Hidayat and guidance has been written and decreed by Allah. It, it, it will be our privilege and honor if we make a little bit of effort. And if we make a little bit of sacrifice and we take the message, you know, I think in this climate of Islamophobia, especially in the last uh, 17 years or so since 9-11, uh, uh, some Muslims sometimes, or Muslims sometimes, I, I, I get the, the feeling, uh, become somewhat despondent. And I think unnecessarily so. Uh, sure, I'm not trying to trivialize the challenges that we face. As Brother Yahya had said, that uh, he also thought that Muslims were people who kind of put bombs in the air and went, to, went into shopping malls and blew everybody up for, for fun's sake, you know, uh, just so that they could get some, some huris or they could get some damsels in, in, in paradise. Uh, that's how it's portrayed in the, in the media, fanatical, uh, bloodthirsty, that kind of thing. But uh, the, 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 the truth has power. The word of Allah has power. And Islam is very logical. Islam is very simple. Islam is very easy to understand. And sometimes, you know, when I've explained Islam to people, I've thought, hey, I wonder if they'll get it because they're filled with so many uh, counter thoughts. And I, and I wonder if I'll be able to articulate uh, the points clearly. And, and it sinks in so easily sometimes, even I get surprised that they, they, they get it. They understand it and, and they, they, they are attracted to it. You know, the peace. Islam gives you that purpose in life. Islam makes you understand why you are in existence. Islam makes you understand why things happen. Islam makes you understand where you are heading, how you should conduct yourself in different situations and, and, and circumstances. Subhanallah. Uh, like he said, he realized it was not just that Christians go to church on a Sunday and Muslims go to, to mosque on a Friday. And, you know, it was a total way of life. And, and when he saw that in, 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 in Muslims, uh, that's what attracted him to Islam. But fortunate for him, uh, he was in the company of people... Uh, uh, who, who, who are abiding by the deen. Sometimes Allah forbid, Allah forbid and Allah forgive us. Our actions actually deter people. They, um, they repel people uh, from the deen of Islam. May Allah wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who are rightly guided themselves and who become a means of hidayat and guidance for others. When you become a means of hidayat and guidance for others, it, it is better for you than any kind of material benefit. Uh, in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right, it's time for us now to continue with our hadith discussion for the week. We're still talking about uh, the topic of sabr, patience, the theme of, of perseverance. And that, that's actually a better word. Perseverance encapsulates the, the, the meaning of the word sabr uh, to a larger extent than patience, although patience is the more commonly used word. Last week, we, we discussed a narration of Bukhari, a very touching narration. Uh, the final moments between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his most beloved daughter Fatima to Zahra radiyallahu anha, Sayyidatu Nisai Ahlil Jannah, the queen of the women of Jannah. Uh, this was his most beloved child, but also this was his only child that was alive at the time of the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, just to quickly recap that hadith that we discussed last week, and Anasin radiyallahu anhu qal, لما ثقل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم جعل يتغشاه الكرب أنس رضي الله عنه narrates that when the health of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم began to deteriorate the pangs of death began overpowering him so what, what happened then was Fatima رضي الله عنها then exclaimed you know she, she proclaimed it was a sigh of sorrow that wa karba abatah that uh, oh Oh, the, how painful are the pangs of death for my father. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even in that moment, even at such a critical stage, even at such a sensitive moment, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Laysa ala abiki karbun ba'd al That don't worry, these are the final pangs now, this is the final suffering. After this, your father is not going to experience any more pain. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was trying to console her. Subhanallah, he was in the pangs of death, but he was consoling his daughter. And then when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into the next world, into the year after, then uh, she, she called out, you know, in sorrow and grief. Ya abata, ajaba rabban da'a. يا أبتا جنة الفردوس مأوى يا أبتا إلى جبريل ننعى that oh my father you have replied to the call of your of your sustainer Allah is calling you to him and you have gone oh my father the garden of Firdaus is your abode oh my father we shall convey this news to Jibril he's no longer going to come and descend because there's no Nabi uh, to descend to and then فلما دفنا when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was was buried قالت فاطمة رضي الله عنها uh, she said to Anas, عنه, one of the servants of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَطَابَتْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَنْ تَحْثُوا عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ التُرَاب Did it please you to throw sand over the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It, it was not an objection as I explained last week, it was just more of an expression of grief. But what do we learn from here? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going through difficulty, but he bore it patiently. Fatima radiallahu anha was going through difficulty. She expressed her grief. There's nothing wrong with that. She, 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 she said what she needed to say. She expressed her sentiment. But she kept her emotions under control in the sense that she never objected to the decree of Allah. And she never did something with, or anything which was inappropriate. So she also bore it patiently. I mean, no one can, can suffer the, 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 pain, the, the pain of separation. After the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like his own daughter Fatima radiallahu anha, they had such a close association. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when returning from journey, he would go to meet her first. When, 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 when he would visit, visit her, she would stand up, greet him and seat him where, where she would be uh, seated. And she resembled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most in his actions and, and, and his conduct. Uh, so we see the, the perseverance and the, and the sabr and the patience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his daughter and Anas radiyallahu an that even though she was expressing this grief he didn't say anything in return because he understood uh, the context in which she was she was saying it now today we, we I move forward and, and I discuss another hadith of uh, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and um, this hadith pertains to another loss in the in the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an Abi Zaidin Usama ibn Zaid ibn Haritha ta mawla Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa hibbihi wa ibn hibbihi qal arsalat bintu an-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna bani qad ihtudira fashhadana fa arsala yuqri as-salam wa yaqul inna lillahi ma akhadha wa lahu ma a'ata wa kullu shay'in 'indahu bi ajalin musamma faltasbir wal tahtasib فأرسلت إليه تقسم عليه ليأتيننا فقام معه سعد بن عبادة ومعاذ بن جبل وأبي بن كعب وزيد بن ثابت ورجال رضي الله عنهم فرفع إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الصبي فأقعده في حجره ونفسه تقعقع ففاضت عيناه فقال سعد يا رسول الله ما هذا فقال هذه رحمة جعلها الله تعالى في قلوب عباده وفي رواية في قلوب من شاء من عباده وإنما يرحم الله من عباده الرحماء متفق عليه. This story here, Usama bin Zaid رضي الله عنه, who was the freed slave of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to free. The slavery was common in those days, but the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Islam encouraged the freeing of slave. He was the beloved and the son of the beloved. He and his father were both very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He narrates the incident that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's daughter Zainab, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had four daughters, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, Zainab and Fatima. All three had passed away before him. Umm Kulthum, Ruqayya and Zainab and Fatima passed away not long after him, radiyallahu anhun. Now Zainab had, uh, had a child, a son, and she sent a message to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying, my son is on the verge of death. My son is on the verge of death. So please come. So the Prophet ﷺ sent her a message. And normally we also convey these words to a person at the time of, of bereavement. When somebody has lost someone close to them, we share these words. Inna lillahi ma akhada wa lahu ma a'ata. Wa kullu shayin indahu bi ajalim musamma. Fal tasbir wal tahtasib. So to teach the ummah a lesson, the Prophet ﷺ sent this message. Um, and what did the message say? To Allah alone belongs all that he takes and to him belongs all that he gives. Meaning this child of yours, 
it was given to you by Allah because it belonged to Allah and it will be taken back by Allah because it belongs to Allah. So uh, everything has an appointed term with Allah. Allah knows exactly for how long he'll give you what, for how long your health will last, for how long your spouse will last, for how long your child will last. So understand that this is a decree from Allah. فَالْتَصْبِرْ وَالْتَحْتَصِبْ So you should exercise patience and be hopeful that Allah will reward you for your patience. Be hopeful that Allah will reward you for, for your patience. The, she then sent a, a message with an oath to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Please come. He's really sick. So the Prophet ﷺ stood up. And Sa'ad bin Ubadah, Mu'ad bin Jabal, Ubay bin Ka'b, Zayd bin Thabit and other Sahaba, they went with the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet ﷺ came, then they gave him the child who was in the pangs of death. And he put the child in his blessed lap. And the child was panting for breath. The child was panting for breath. So the Prophet ﷺ's tears began to flow. You know when a child is suffering, the parents and the grandparents feel it. So Sa'ad radiallahu an, he thought that this is a bit strange. He assumed that to cry was contrary to being patient. That the Prophet ﷺ should not be crying because when you cry, it's, he assumed that it means you're not being patient. So he inquired that, what is this, O Messenger of Allah? Meaning, why are you crying? Should you not be patient and, and holding back the tears? So the Prophet ﷺ said, this is mercy. The fact that you're crying, it is mercy, which Allah has placed in the hearts of his servants. And according to another narration, the, the wording is more elaborative, that this is a mercy which Allah places in whichever of his servants he wills. And Allah is merciful to those of his servants who are merciful to others. This narration is in Bukhari Muslim. What do we learn from here? That to cry, you know, what, not, not wailing and screaming and shrieking, that, that obviously is inappropriate. But for the tears to flow, for a person to cry, for a person to sob, that is natural, that is normal. That is as a bodily function, it's an emotional function. It's, it's the release valve of the, of, of the body. So the Prophet said, it is by the mercy of Allah that we don't have hearts that are so hard that even that uh, when my own grandchild is, is, is dying in my lap, that I don't cry. The fact that I can cry, that is a mercy from Allah. Wa uh, and Allah has placed this mercy in, in whomsoever he wills from his servants. So we, we learn from here that to cry and to feel grief and, and to express emotion, that is not contrary to patience. But when you start objecting to the decision of Allah, when you start wailing, when you start making inappropriate remarks, when you cannot uh, keep your emotions within the parameters of the Sharia, then all of that is contrary to patience. But to feel pain, to express that pain, to, to tear, to cry, that is not in any way contrary to patience. So, so what do we learn? We learn that it's, it's good for, for pious people to be present when a person is about to die because of the blessings that they bring with them. It is permissible to, to shed tears, but you should not complain, you should not, you should not wail. It is meritorious to console a person who is in difficulty by encouraging them to be patient and by, by telling them that you'll get reward for your patience. It's meritorious to visit those who were ill. The baby was, was, was ill. And um, we should learn these words. Inna lillahi ma akhada walahu ma a'ta wa kullu shayin indahu bi ajalim musamma faltasbir wal tahtasib. We'll leave it there for this week. Inshallah, time for a break. When we come back, we continue our discussion on Jannah. <laughs> Welcome back. We continue now with our feature pertaining to Jannah, Paradise. The last time we spoke about the clothing of Paradise, you know, clothing forms uh, a great part of, of our focus in life. Uh, some people more than others, some people love to be prim and proper, nothing wrong with that. As long as it does not become an obsession, as long as it does not border on extravagance, and as long as you're not doing it to boast and to compete with others. You look nice because uh, it's appropriate to look nice. In Allah Ta'ala, Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah is beautiful and Allah appreciates beauty. So we, we discussed a few verses pertaining to the clothing of the people of Jannah. Yuhallawna fiha min asawira min dahab. They will be adorned with, with bracelets of gold. Wayalbasuna thiyaban khudram min sundus. And they will wear green garments of, of fine and thick silk. Min sundus wa istabraq. Then uh, we also discussed the verse. يُحَلَّوْنَ فِيهَا مِنْ أَسَاوِرَ مِنْ ذَهَبِ وَلُؤْلُؤَ They will be adorned with bracelets of gold and pearls. وَلِبَأْسُهُمْ فِيهَا حَرِيرٌ And their garments will be of silk. And we explained that uh, once Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a piece of cloth of silk and people were looking at it and appreciating its beauty. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said 
that uh, this, this, this silk of this world would not even be the equivalent of the handkerchief of, of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh and he was one of those who was martyred during the Battle of Khandak. And most importantly, I mentioned uh, when we concluded this discussion the last time around about the clothing of the people at Jannah, that the clothing will never wear out. You know how you feel hard so when your favorite dress now gets uh, burnt by the domestic or when your favorite kurta loses its shine or when your favorite shoe now uh, has a hole in the sole. Uh, that, that old pair of tackies that your feet are so comfortable in uh, but at some point you have to let it go in Jannah no you, it doesn't deteriorate it will look as beautiful as it looked the very first day now today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the children of the believers in, in paradise many times believers lose their children in infancy uh, so either your child you lose a child through a miscarriage or the child is a toddler and or an infant uh, you get caught death or you get some medical complication or whatever natural causes the child passes on now what happens to that child that child is is awaiting the parents and that child will be a means for the parents to be entered into into paradise there is a verse of the quran kareem where allah wa ta'ala says kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahina that every person is a pledge for what he has earned Every person is a pledge for what he has earned. And Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma, when, when explaining this verse, he would say that the, this is in reference to the children of the believers. They will not be held in pledge by their deeds, rather their Lord will reunite them with their family. Uh, according to a, a hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains that from amongst the believers, if there are those who have lost three children, you know, to lose three children is not easy. Um, before they reach the age of puberty, before they mature, you lose three children before they mature, what will happen is that uh, on the day of Qiyamah, as a result of le losing those three children, Allah will grant you to paradise, as long as you, you bore it patiently. And uh, Allah will say to the children on the day of Qiyamah, that go into paradise, you had passed on before you matured, so you, you were not responsible for any of your actions. And those children will say, no, oh Allah, we are not going into paradise until our parents come with us. And uh, then it will be said to them that go into paradise with your parents. So when you lose three children uh, before they reach the age of puberty, understand that they're waiting for you in the year after and they want to pull you towards paradise. But then it's not only three children because the Sahaba also thought, and may Allah reward them for expressing this thought, that there are not that many people who will lose three children before puberty. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, O the Prophet of Allah, what about those who lose two children? And the Prophet ﷺ waited for the revelation and the revelation came and he said, well, for those who lose two children before puberty, they'll get the same reward. And then they said, what about those who lose one child? And the Prophet ﷺ waited for the revelation and it came in the affirmative and he said that even one child, you lose one child before puberty. It's very difficult when you lose a child when, when, when they're that young, right? And you bear it patiently, then Allah will grant you Jannah. Then the Prophet ﷺ went even further and he spoke about the miscarried fetus. In other words, not the child that was born and passed away after birth before reaching the age of puberty, but rather even the miscarried fetus. For that, uh, for that child's parents, that child will be waiting on the day of Qiyamah and will be refusing to go to Jannah until Allah grants permission for the parents to go with. So it's not something that you wish upon yourself or anybody, but if it happens, realize it's a means inshallah for you to go into Jannah. Next week, we'll continue with the discussion pertaining to the children of the believers in, uh, in paradise. I think it's time for me to, as they say, love you and uh, leave you. I don't know if that's the, the, the correct uh, expression, but nonetheless, it's been an absolute privilege to be in your company this Friday evening. It's, it's a hot evening. It's been a hot day. Uh, take it easy. Relax tonight. Uh, enjoy the company of your, of your spouse, of your children. Um, let your home be Jannah and paradise on earth. Enjoy your weekend. Relax, but constructively. Don't waste time and don't do anything which will result in the displeasure of Allah. Wa and if Allah has willed, same place, same time, next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.